Hi. The organization I lead, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, has a long history of successful collaboration with the government. Through 80 years of work in refugee resettlement, our care for unaccompanied children, and our ongoing management of family reunification. We work with partners like Reverend Wilker from Lutheran Church of the Reformation. During last year's family separation crisis, LRS was one of only two organizations asked by the government to help with family reunifications. Neither LIRS nor our sister organization, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, received any government payment for that work. But without a moment's hesitation, we stepped up to respond based on an unwavering commitment to family unity and ensuring all God's children are welcomed, protected, and offered love and warmth, not concrete floors and mylar, mylar blankets. The term unaccompanied minors is seemingly meant to give the impression that these children come to the border by themselves. It masks the fact that some are unaccompanied because we strip them from their parents' arms. So it is my duty to report that the assertion that family separation has ended is not true. In fact, we have nearly 40 children who, have separate, who were separated even after the policy supposedly ended. Four of them tiny babies, less than one year old. They were not unaccompanied minors until our government made them so. As a faith-based organization, we believe no child should be separated from a parent in order to deter other parents. As a faith-based organization, we believe no child should be held hostage as bait in order to subject family members to fingerprinting for immigration enforcement purposes. And so we request the formal end to the memorandum of agreement between the Department of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services. We were heartened to hear the Assistant Secretary's testimony on that fact. We are trying desperately to reunite families. And this agreement has significantly impeded parents and other sponsors from coming forward and prolong the time that vulnerable children are separated from their family. But our efforts to reunify families are much broader, and that is the focus of my testimony today. Right now, some children are being housed in large shelter facilities that face allegations of sexual and physical abuse. Some are kept in a Walmart-turned-warehouse among nearly a 1,000 other children. Others are in a federal influx facility where 144 children sleep in one room with no state regulation and little oversight. So what if I told you what you know, that there is an alternative, that I could provide many of these children with loving set of, a loving set of foster parents who could offer a child not just shelter, but a safe and stable home, that this care could help the child reunify with their actual family safely and more quickly. And that in the interim, these nurturing foster care parents would help the child learn, read, play sports, tuck them into a warm bed at night. And that this care would cost a third or a half of the price of warehousing children. As a parent or grandparent, wouldn't you choose the family-like setting? And as an appropriator, wouldn't you choose the setting that is better for kids, better for taxpayers? Well, this choice isn't theoretical. It's the one government faces every day when it places a child at a temporary influx facility like Homestead rather than a family setting like the care that LIRS provides. This year, we've already cared for 549 kids. Yet as large shelters grow, we have loving foster care parents today with empty homes. Remarkably, less than half of the care that we've offered to the government is being utilized at this moment. How is that possible? Well, here's what we're up against. Right now, private prisons and for-profit companies account for over 70% of the immigration bed facilities in this country. We know the government's extraordinary logistical burdens, but caution against settling for the convenience of for-profit influx and detention facilities. These entities are not guided by the best interests of a child, but by the best interests of their shareholders. As criminal justice reform has pushed private prisons out of the American penitentiary system, they've turned to immigration to turn a profit. And profit they have. 
Caliburn, the company that runs, runs Homestead, earns $775 per child per day. Since 2018, they've received contracts for $545 million. Just as I was visiting Homestead, Caliburn was trying to sell $100 million in stock and said the need to house migrant children is, quote, projected to drive growth, as Congresswoman Lee pointed out. Today's testimony has shown that they are not qualified to care for children, let, al let alone traumatized migrant children. So rather than a homestead, how about a home instead? For 40 years, LIRS has established proven models of family and family-like care for unaccompanied minors until they can be reunited with their families, a model of care that is small, safe, and family-centric. We ensure children receive trauma-informed care and that all our foster parents and caseworkers are licensed by the state and receive up-to-date information on the new child welfare standards. Because we must never forget that these children are not just in our custody, they are in our care. And while they are, that burden of responsibility, of protection, of oversight, sits right here with American leadership and the power you wield. Thank you.